Have you ever wanted to play with Black Lotus in EDH? Well, with Garth One Eye, you can. Welcome back to The Bulkhead. My name is Kale. I'm Brett. And today we're gonna to be talking about Garth One Eye, one of our favorite commanders from Modern Horizons 2 and favorite commanders in general. Obviously the rules text of Cast the Black Lotus was initially super, super interesting to people uh, during spoiler season. And I think the card honestly has lived up to its uh, you know hype. Oh yeah, for sure. I've been playing a ton of Garth recently. And I feel like every single mode, even the six mana ship and dragon is uh, worth playing. It's basically starting the game with 14 cards in your hand, you know? It's a uh, that's what it pretty, feels pretty, like. pretty good, pretty good advantage to start the game with. Take a peek down in the description for the deck list for this deck. Uh, so you can follow along with us as we're going through the cards that we brought out here. The deck can be pretty easily broken up into three categories, haste enablers, untappers and tappers. And uh, yeah, we'll start with the haste enablers. There are six haste enablers in this deck, four of them being enchantments, one artifact, and one creature. The best among them being that one artifact, Thousand Year Elixir. So it doesn't give, it's like a pseudo haste, it gives um, creatures with activate abilities are, are able to activate them right away. Mm -hmm. And then you can pay one and tap it to untap a creature, which is huge in this deck because all the, there's 26 creatures with tapping abilities and you want to be constantly tapping, untapping your creatures. It's just extra gravy. Yeah, exactly. The haste enablers really are sort of like the backbone of the deck. You always want to have these down, preferably on turn three, obviously with Samut a little bit farther along, but it just makes all of your mana dorks that you're casting later come into play and tap for all of the mana that they cost as well as more. Um, it helps you in that way turbo out Garth. Without them, you're a lot slower, uh, a lot more vulnerable to removal and everything like that. It feels much worse to play one of these like big six drops that does have a tap ability, no enter the battlefield effect, and it dying before it gets back to you because it didn't have haste. Yeah, casting like a Vassar the Dreadful. And then <laughs> yeah. Having somebody just path it or whatever, it's sort of like, well, that was a, you know, I got time walked basically. Yep, exactly. And Which you don't want in a multiplayer format. Any format. <laughs> yeah. The next category would be untappers. There's 15 different untappers in the deck, and there's four that I'd like to highlight just as being by far the best because they affect all your creatures and some of them for multiple uh, turns. So there's Quest for Renewal, Augusta, Dean of Order, Seaborn Muse, and Drum Bellower. All super, super powerful. We've seen Quest for Renewal particularly be super, super powerful multiple times because it comes down on turn two. Uh, and it just slowly ticks up and, you know, then you have a Seedborn used that's uh, invulnerable to creature removal. And I mean, the deck is fueling that too. I mean, the counter's going super quick because all, you know, there's 40 plus creatures with tap abilities in the deck. Yes. It's part of the, some of the strongest curve outs though. It feels like yeah. Oh yeah, because it's a two drop. Yeah, 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 for sure. The other 11 untappers are pretty generic. You have like your Kelpie guys, your Vizier of Tumbling Sands, Cure Follower, and Just Guys Ascendancy. I didn't put it in with these top four just because the amount of non-creatures is somewhat low or yeah. not very high. So yeah, um, you yeah maybe you get like one, but it's usually during your turn because it's like a sorcery piece of ramp. Yeah, it is super super powerful with Garth uh, because obviously you have Disenchant, Brain Geyser, Terror, Regrowth, and Black Lotus that you can cast which immediately triggers Jeskai Ascendancy, allowing you to cast another thing, especially if you have a Mana Dork in play. So uh, important to remember, obviously, that you have access to Garth all the time as the commander. So playing cards like Jeskai Ascendancy, even in a primarily creature-based deck, still makes sense here. Oh yeah, for sure. So obviously like the, the next biggest sort of category in the deck and kind of the main spice of the deck and where all of your utility comes from are the actual tappers. There's 26 in this deck. Um, obviously you have Garth, you have Urtai the Corrupted, Elvish Piper, Bloodline Keeper, uh, Marika, Fabro Elder, Avatar of Woe, Viscera the Dreadful. The list goes on and on. Uh, the important thing is that many of these cards are not made to be activated three, four times in a turn oh, yeah. or whatever. Um, and so with cards like Visara the Dreadful, you can you know, basically wrath your opponent's board, especially if you have something like a Drumbell or a Seedborn Muse or a Quest for Renewal, um, and you're untapping every turn, 
you know, you can just really keep things off the board um, aggressively uh, the whole turn cycle. And the same is true with something like Urtai the Corrupted, uh, <laughs> which has been super annoying in this deck. Um, it does cost one mana to activate and you do have to sacrifice a creature, but when you get rolling, yeah, and Brett is pointing to Bloodline Keeper because Bloodline Keeper is an excellent way to enable that. Those two together on the board are kind of like a soft lock, yep, for uh, sure. making it very difficult for your opponents to do absolutely anything. Um, and it doesn't seem like that immediately, um, <laughs> but when Brett has 10 permanents in play that all have tap abilities, untap effects, etc., cetera, uh, it's kind of like hard to tell <laughs> oh, yeah. how many spells he can, he can counter, especially because there are a bunch of random uh, mana dorks and stuff that he can sack. Yeah, because you never know, like, maybe I'm feeling a little crazy and it'll sack, like, oh. you know, some important things. <laughs> He's always feeling a little crazy. <laughs> so there's six different categories of tappers that we sort of separate these into. Um, the first being card draw, you have Arcanist the Omnipotent, Archivist, Enclave Cryptologist, Merfolk Looter, and Thought Courier. Um, obviously something like Arcanist is just absolutely busted. Drawing three cards, untapping it, drawing three cards again, incredible. Um, the rest of these, I've seen them be super important to some of your best draws in terms of their consistency. Because even if there's an early wrath that allows you to just draw a couple extra pieces of cardboard over the course of the game um, and, and rebuild, even if we're wrathing away all your creatures. Um, and obviously it, it allows for fixing both in terms of mana as well as the correct effect for the correct situation, whether you need um, a Seedborn Muse type effect or a haste granting type of effect um, at the certain time. Um, they're just super, super important to that consistency of the deck. Yeah, and having um, regrowth on Garth also is nice with like the two looter effects, having necro Necrotic Ooze and Death Rate Shaman. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel as bad if you have to, you know, discard something that's you would want to play later in the game. There's a good chance you'll get it back or have be able to activate its ability through something like that. Yeah, and then in terms of interaction, I talked about a lot of these because the interaction creatures are some of the most powerful. It feels like as time has gone on, EDH has become a more creature-based format, I would say. Our um, group, at least, yes, for sure, is yeah. definitely creature-based. Yeah, yeah, and not everywhere, but for sure in a lot of different playgroups and against a lot of different decks. So cards like Beguiler of Wills, they'll let you just steal creatures repeatedly. Or Marika or Visar the Dreadful or Avatar of Woe, um, as well as Kamal the Pitfire. This card has been surprisingly good for a six drop, six one. Yeah, one of my favorites, just flavor from a flavor standpoint and it just bolt multiple times a turn. It was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. For no cost, you know, or just like the top. So and then having Haste by itself is, I mean, it, having that one toughness is pretty harsh, but having haste on it, it does feel nice in case something goes wrong with your haste enablers that you hopefully had earlier in the game. Yeah, it allows you to sort of like come out of nowhere and uh, just actually have a, a relevant play even if your haste ability is, is taken off the board. So those are super, super important. I've seen those come into play a lot. And then equally super, super important is the, the ramp creatures that are available here. Um, Bloom Tender and Fabro Elder, I feel like are at the center of all your most busted games. Uh, they just tap for so much mana, um, obviously with Garth in play, but there's also a lot of uh, multicolored other permanents and spells as well in here that will fuel them. Um, and then obviously we have uh, the one mana, um, mana creatures like Birds of Paradise, Noble Hierarch, Death Rite, Ignoble Hierarch. Um, the classics. Are, yeah, the classics, great turn one play. Um, great for ramping out your other stuff, uh, turn to like Thousand Year Elixir or Fervor or whatever. And obviously they have powerful separate abilities on their own that are that are relevant to uh, specifically Death Rite, um, which allows you to utilize some of the looting effects that you mentioned before exactly. um, to generate value um, and make sure that it stays a, a mana dork. And then we have Elvish Piper as well, which is obviously a super powerful card. If you get to activate this three or four times, in a turn cycle or whatever, um, you're just slamming down some of these giant interactive elements or these card advantage engines. My dream with that is to have Arcanus, Visara, and Kamal are from Odyssey. It's like a pit fighter cycle. I always want to go 
Elvish Piper on like you know a turn cycle and put one, each one down. It's like, like that'd be awesome. The Avengers assembly. <laughs> yeah. And Captain America. And then so we have some tutor creatures as well in Fauna Shaman and Captain Sisse. Uh, very important, like we said previously, to make sure that we have all of the pieces that we need available to us. Most of the interaction cards are legendary, and yeah. then Arcanus for card draw is legendary also, which is pretty relevant. I mean, I'm usually getting, a lot of times when I'm tutoring, I want something to, or like some sort of piece of interaction. Most of the interactions on creatures, Fierce Guardianship and Deflecting Swap for interaction that's not coming from these creatures. And uh, Garth, I mean, also having Disenchant and Terror on him is another, you know, two big pieces of interaction. Yeah, and I mean, something like Captain Sisse, which is like theoretically the better of the two, though obviously Fauna Shaman's more flexible, but you do have to pay mana, you do have to discard a creature, so that can get a little hairy. But I mean, like you said, it gets all of the interaction pieces, it gets card draw from Arcanus, the Omnipotent, and it gets Samut for haste, meaning you can basically build up from nothing just by playing Captain Sisse. Uh, and I think that that's, that's super, super important for this deck. And it feels like pseudo card draw sometimes, I mean, because you are just tapping it drawing a specific card and, you know, doing that like a couple times a turn cycle and it's just, yeah, it feels good. She's really powerful in this deck. For sure. Uh, two other very important pieces as part of like these soft lock states that you tend to get into. Giver of Runes, Mother of Runes, um, both incredibly powerful. Obviously being able to keep up that protection around turn cycles with Seedborn Muse type effects, super powerful. A lot of what um, we often want to try to do uh, in this deck is target one specific um, piece of the puzzle and try to knock it out of play so that the rest of the dominoes will start to fall down. Like we said, cards like Avatar of Woe or uh, Visar the Dreadful are a lot weaker if they don't have haste um, or if they aren't able to be untapped multiple times. And so these two cards, as well as with uh, Sereth the Viper's Fang, will give all of your creatures enough protection that they can do what they need to do uh, except in the face of a wrath, basically. Right. Uh, and so it cuts down a lot of the options for your opponents um, in, a, in a space where they already have very few options. Obviously, Garth gives you so many options, allowing you to, to ramp or take down problematic permanents on their side, whether that's an artifact or an enchantment or a non-black creature. And then also to Brain Geyser if they do go ahead and wrath at the last minute. It's one of the best parts of Garth. I, I mean, besides Lotus, I'd say Brain Geyser is probably the next best. Like, yeah pretty easily because just once you play all your tappers and like something like a wrath happens it just doesn't really feel as bad because you know you're just gonna have the ability to tap all your mana to draw all you know up 10 cards yeah exactly yeah in response to the wrath and then untap on your turn with a bunch of mana and presumably still one of your haste effects in play which means that cards like bloom tender faber elder that come down just start generating you a bunch of mana to get garth back in play it's very snowbally. Oh yeah. Oh, wicked snowbally. That's a perfect word for the stuck. Our last piece here is a, a, a token creator, which is a bloodline keeper. We mentioned that super powerful with Urtai to really lock people out of the game. It also just makes a million flying vampires, um, and then it flips to the other side. So you can you know play if you have a haster and then tap her out, you or like one of the uh, on tappers per every turn. Yeah. You can flip it on your next turn. Yeah. Which is pretty good because. Yeah. So buffs all the vampires by two. Other vampires creatures you control get plus two plus two. And then it becomes a five five and it also has uh, the same abilities as on the front, which means that you're not losing out on any value. Flying armies in EDH still always very powerful. Um, okay. It's important to have blockers as well for flyers. Like Skither Hicks it has, to be, it has to be mentioned in every, every yes. deck deck video. Skither Hicks, no. <laughs> We all know about Skither Hicks, the Blight Dragon. Uh, being a huge problem. Uh, one creature that has neither uh, a tap ability or untap ability that's in the deck is Necrotic Ooze. And like we were just talking about, if a board weight comes down and you know you have a couple of really important creatures out there, you play Necrotic Ooze and you have all those abilities back. I think it just... does have a tap ability, actually. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it has all of them, in fact. <laughs> or we could put it like that, which is perfect. <laughs> and yeah, it just feels um, very powerful in the stuck. It, it was uh, one of the later additions to it. Um, I just hadn't really played with it a lot before. And yeah, it's uh, found a home for sure. And then another piece that we'll mention here is that there is a lot of ramp in the deck. And that's just because Garth has a Wooberg cost. Uh, it costs seven the first time it dies and has to be played again. 
because of the commander tax. So you really want to be able to cast it. It just gives you so many options. And recasting Garth for a second or third time, super powerful because it resets all of the spells that you're able to cast off of Garth. Um, and so that's super, super important. And obviously with a card like Brain Geyser on Garth, like we mentioned before, you want to be able to do that for 10 when they wrath your board because they will or you'll just win. Um, so super important to make sure that you're hitting your lands on time, they are the right color, uh, and you continue to hit your, your land drops and your mana dorks later on into the game. Yeah, I feel like a lot of my decks have around 10 pieces of ramp. This one has the seven ramp tappers and then nine additional pieces. So it's definitely the most ramp heavy deck of constructed and feel, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it's very needed to be built like that. Yeah, I've never seen you not be able to cast all of the things that you need to cast. And so I think that's a testament to the integrity of the mana base, as well as the amount of time that you've put into making sure that you have enough ramp. Yes. Commander sure. Commander's about ramp more and more as we go on. Uh, and this is just, you know, very specifically an example of where it's super, super powerful. Another card that we want to highlight in this deck is Dismiss Into Dreams, which is super spicy, very suited for this deck. Uh, it's obviously a seven mana enchantment, but it's incredibly powerful. Um, it allows you to just destroy all of your opponent's creatures. It basically turns all of your untappers into Visara the Dreadful uh, or Avatar of Woe, <laughs> which is super, super powerful. Um, and so that's like a super fun card in this deck, especially with all the ramp, you're able to cast it early um, and just provides you value the whole game. It's a sneaky one. It doesn't seem like it would be, I mean, seven mana enchantment that doesn't do any, so anything itself, but yeah, it can just feel like a wrath almost. Yeah, yeah. And also super, super fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very unique to this deck. It's like, I don't know where else I would be playing this. Maybe um, Niv Mizzet. Oh, I, oh, what is it? Yeah. We'll ask Alex about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in terms of the mana base, it's pretty standard fetch, shock, triome. Uh, obviously all the five color lands are present here. Uh, it's really good to be able to fetch out the specific lands that you want and that you need at any given time. Uh, obviously fetch lands are good, we know this. Or uh, duels. Or duels, yeah. If you want to play <laughs> duels because you have fat wallet like Brett, uh, you're welcome to throw some duels in there, you know? All of them are uh, applicable here. Oh yeah, big of time. Okay. If there ever was a deck for duels, this is it. So yeah, that's basically kind of like the uh, way that we build Garth One-Eye. Um, how would you build Garth? Do you have a deck with Garth? Any spicy inclusions that we didn't mention here? Um, feel free to let us know down in the comments. Um, also down in the description, we'll have a deck list available for you. Take a peek at, if you wanna export it, build your own, feel free to do so. Thanks again for coming to the Bulkhead to hang out with us and we'll see you next time. Till next time.